So as we consider the future of cities and increased adoption of IoT systems, one big concern will be, or is, network security. Mm -hmm. How does this factor into CUSP's research and what sort of considerations are especially important when you're building cloud-connected systems? Yeah. Uh, I'm no expert in cybersecurity right now. CUSP has really been on the sensing end rather than on the actuating end. Mm -hmm. Um, clearly, the concerns are much greater on the actuating side than on the sensor side. Um, and frankly, you know, CUSP is doing a lot of things that that is just one of them that we haven't really tackled yet. But, you know, everything from personal medical devices all the way up to big electrical uh, utility systems, you've really got to worry about these security issues. I think in general, the world has not paid enough attention to it. And in fact, you read about it in the paper almost every week that somebody's gotten clobbered. So um, today we can collect data really at, at, unpre at unprecedented rates and unprecedented uh, amounts um, for so many things that we couldn't in the mm -hmm. past. Mm -hmm. What sort of tools are most useful for gaining insights about data and how important do you feel are data visualizations for you know, teasing out meaning in data? So I, I don't think that there is a universal tool for teasing out information from mm -hmm. data. Uh, it's very much of a one-of kind of thing. That's why we have data scientists, after mm -hmm. all, to understand how to apply those tools or develop new ones. Uh, visualization is extraordinarily important, I think. Uh, you know, you can ask, what are the highest data rate channels into the human brain? And you don't have too many choices, right? Tactile, olfactory, auditory. The visual system wins by far. I mean, you look at what the bandwidth is you need to transmit an image or video versus what it is to take an audio bit stream, for example. So it is the visual system, but we tend in the big data world to work in so many dimensions, high dimensions, that one of the challenges is understanding how to compress that high dimensional data into the kind of two or three dimensional data or visualizations that our brains can process. It seems like in some cases, data has the potential to confirm what we already intuit for instance, um, energy usage might peak in the winter or um, city bikes might be used more in the spring. How do data scientists get past their biases in order to find the outliers? Yeah. Uh, boy, that's part of a training of a scientist more generally, right? How, how to ignore your biases, how to keep asking yourself what's wrong with this thing that I found rather than what's right with it. Look, part of what we're doing in urban is just documenting and understanding in more detail the things one expects. There's a daily pattern in power use, in communications, in economic activity, uh, which has never really been measured before. So can we measure all of that? Then what's really interesting is to start to look for the anomalies, the things that go beyond the expected. And you know that, that's an art form more than it is something that you can say, this is how you do it. I, you know, one of the things um, one can say about big data is that it really is good for really only two things, and broadly. All right? One is resource allocation. Can I understand how to better allocate police, how to turn on generation at the right time, and so on. So managing resources, optimizing some system. The other is to look for the outliers. And so, for example, can I find the anomalies in Twitter feeds that will tell me when a flash mob is about to happen or something like that? Those are really only the two uses, if you think about it. So what role do you feel does uh, crowdsourced data have in urban informatics? You know, we have different ways of collecting data about the city. Uh, in situ sensors, so the temperature or light sensors in this room, for example, or some other, that's fine. We have city records data, utility bills, for example. Uh, we have the kind of synoptic broad coverage sensing that we're doing with the observatory. And then we have citizen-derived science, whether it's sound or our air quality or whatever, temperature, et cetera. One, uh, they all need to play together. Uh, and one of the main uses is to intercalibrate and validate one way of measuring against another because you may sometimes, you know, for example, in a city like Bombay, uh, you may have the synoptic. Uh, it's pretty easy to put a, a camera up, but it's a lot harder to get in situ sensing because the economy is not well enough developed or the infrastructure is there. So you want to be able to cross calibrate and 
cross-validate against those uh, different modalities. Another thing is that, of course, the citizen science engages the citizen and just makes them pay more attention to what it is they're measuring, just like my uh, jawbone here makes me pay more attention to how much I'm walking and sleeping and, and so on. The thing I would worry about, though, and, and uh, we really need to be able to work on this more intensely, is the quality of the data that comes back from uh, 100,000 different cell phones, for example. Mm -hmm. No doubt some of them will be miscalibrated, some of them are off some of the time, and being able to manage that data quality issue is something that you've got to work on. I mean, you know, a lot of citizen science started out as just a cool thing to do, which is great, but if you want to make it a serious scientific tool, you have to worry about these quality issues. So a major challenge for the future is energy, which of course you've thought a lot about. Do you feel it's more important to prioritize energy con con uh, conservation and efficiency over the search for renewable resources? And how does I IoT applications factor into that? We need to work on both sides of the energy equation, both energy supply and um, energy demand. Mm -hmm. The IoT is really most potent, I think, on the demand side. Uh, you know, energy is used in a myriad of ways, heating, lighting, mobility, industrial processes. Uh, and many people, including I, believe that there are great opportunities to apply sensing, modeling, control to really optimize the efficiency and uh, reduce waste energy. And I believe that's really where the IoT enters uh, in the energy equation. If you want to go on the supply side, we don't have so many facilities. They can be, and they already are, well instrumented, whether it's a nuclear plant or a wind plant or a biofuel plant. And um, uh, it's not going to be as, as potent. Those already have great drivers for optimization. Uh, one thing I would uh, say slightly contradicting what you said is it's it not just renewable resources that we're after. Uh, in general, we're after emission-free uh, or emissions light resources. And that starts with natural gases compared to coal, but then goes on, for example, to coal with carbon capture and storage or nuclear uh, fission. And I think one has to include those in the equation as well if you want to reduce the emissions. You've led uh, research teams um, in innovation and energy issues in both in the government, mm -hmm. um, in private sectors and in academia. Is there a huge difference in the kind of rate pace um, <laughs> of innovation adoption? Uh, so, so they're all three very different. And you know, in the corporate world, the goals are very clear. It is, as I mentioned, it's to make money, to do it legally, and to do it reliably. And that's a wonderful goal that focuses the organization, determines its pace, uh, its structure its culture. If you go to academia, um, it's almost exact opposite. The goals are not very clear. It's to go out and discover something interesting. Uh, it's to educate students. But they're not as easily measurable. And in fact, in contrast to business, almost nobody's in charge. It's a set of free agent uh, uh, faculty. Um, uh, and it moves very slowly because, in fact, uh, there are many voices that need to be heard from the faculty. Uh, the government has got almost the worst of both worlds. It's got to actually do something, but at the same time, there are so many different voices that it moves very slowly. On the other hand, it moves at scale. It can do projects that uh, certainly academia can't do, um, and it can take the kind of risks, in fact, should be taking the kind of risks that the private sector won't take in order to move things forward. So often you will see the government getting bashed by Congress or the media or the opposition uh, for failing at some project. But in fact, it's supposed to fail because that's the only way it can hit home runs is by swinging. It's such an interesting perspective to bring to CUSP now. Yeah, yeah. Really, it's exciting. Um, what is on the horizon for CUSP projects? Um, we are interested, um, you measured at one point sound. We're, we're interested in, in learning how to measure sound. Uh, around the city. I, you know, as a native New Yorker who did not live here for most of my life until three years ago, coming back to New York City, it's wonderful, but
but the sound is my biggest complaint. And uh, I think if we can measure the sound, characterize it, uh, and um, help with the enforcement of the sound regulations, a lot of people will be very happy for that. Um, I think uh, another thing we need to be doing, we've been engaged in data collection, integration, and analysis, but we haven't really started to build high fidelity simulations or models of the city. And obviously transport is a one in which people have been doing for quite a while, but to then layer in energy use, public health, economics onto that to build a really high fidelity validated model of the city is something that we'd like to be doing as well. I think on the education front, we'd like to expand the numbers. I'd like to reach out. Some of our students now come from the New York City government and are oh, studying with us part time. I'd like to expand that to cities around the world. I think it would be wonderful to take some of the public servants from cities abroad, particularly in the developing world, let them spend a year here learning some of the techniques, working with the corresponding New York City department, and then go back and, and carry that to their home countries. Is there an IoT application, that either conceptual or actually realized, that you think has the potential to make a really major positive impact on the future? I mean, there's an IoT application that's coming out of what we're doing, um, and that is uh, the smart trash can. I don't know if you've, you've heard about that. This is to help you understand how much waste you're putting in and, and how you might sort that waste into recyclable and so on. And actually, it, I just saw it on Kickstarter uh, today. So it's, it's up there on the web, and one can contribute some money to it. Um, I think more generally, you know, if you had the equivalent of the policeman's body camera, um, and you could basically do a full diary of your daily life, which we can do. But then we developed the software uh, to really be able to compress that down and extract the relevant features, again with privacy and so on. That that from a social science point of view, a behavioral point of view, that would be wonderfully valuable data. So I'd like to see something like that. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Uh, for our viewers to learn more about CUSP, we'll be posting resources online for you to check out. Thanks so much. Okay, happy to chat. Thank you.